In the book of Genesis, there is a story that may be the high point of the Old Testament. One day God came to Abraham and he said, I want you to take your son Isaac, your son whom you love, and I want you to take him to the mountain and there I want you to offer him to me as a sacrifice. Whenever I read that story, my heart kind of stops for a moment. I have two sons and I cannot imagine what I would think if God had told me to do something like that. And it was especially egregious for Abraham because as you know, God had previously come to Abraham and said, Abraham, in Isaac your blessing will be found. Isaac's your legacy. I'm going to bless you through your son Isaac. In Isaac, all of the promises I've made to you are going to be realized. So Abraham was truly on the horns of a dilemma. Over here he had the clear instruction of God to take Isaac's life. And over here he had the promise of God that in Isaac he was going to be blessed. It isn't until we come all the way through the Old Testament and arrive at the book of Hebrews that we discover how Abraham was able to make the decision that he made. We learn in the book of Hebrews that Abraham finally deduced from this situation that if God had told him he was going to bless him through Isaac and God had told him to take Isaac's life, the only way that could come out was that God was going to resurrect Isaac from the dead. That's how he made the decision. But as you well know, it never got to that point. God wanted to see if Abraham was willing to do what he asked him to do. But as you know, just before Abraham was to carry out God's instructions, the Lord intervened. And the words of the Lord in his intervention are recorded for us in Genesis chapter 22. And these are the words. And the Lord said, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The phrase, the Lord will provide, in the Old Testament language is a name for God. It is the term Jehovah Jireh. Say that with me, Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide. And if you take it even into the nuance of the Old Testament language, it literally says the Lord will see to it. He will see to it. Every time I read that, I get encouraged in my heart. I'm not unlike all of you. I have my moments every week when I wonder what's going on, and I need to remind myself that the Lord will see to it. The Lord will provide. Maybe you got a disappointment this week as a follower of Christ, and I just want to encourage you. The Lord will see to it. He will provide. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. He will see to it. And I want to share with you today a New Testament commentary on God's words to Abraham. But before I do that, I'd like to take just a moment and answer this question. What is money? Because if we don't understand that, none of the rest of what I'm going to say is going to really catch hold in your life. When you ask the question, what is money, you're not asking, what does money look like? We all know that. We're not asking the question about the uh, paper and the print or the coin and the image. What we're asking is what is the meaning of money? What is the message of money? And it's really important that we get it, so I want to try to help you with this little illustration. Someone has said that money is life converted into currency. And what that means is that when you go to work tomorrow, whether you work for a salary or you're on a clock or however you are remunerated, you go there and you put in your 8 to 10 hours or your 40 to 50 hours a week or how many hours you work, then your employer says, okay, because you have given me 40 or 50 hours of your life, I'm going to give you this amount of money. And they give you your paycheck. Your paycheck literally represents 
your life. You gave 40 to 50 hours of your life that week, and it now has been converted into this piece of paper you call your paycheck. Your life converted into currency. It's so easy for us to think when it comes to money that it's just paper and coins, and what does that have to do with anything? And we need to understand that it is not just paper and coins. Money is your life converted into currency. And that explains why in the Bible it becomes such a critical issue. That's why God says you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve them both. It doesn't say you can't love money. It says you can't let it become your love. It doesn't say you can't have money. It says you can't serve it, and you can't serve money and serve God at the same time. So once you understand why money is so important, then you understand why it is critical for us to have these lessons and be reminded again that this core value is a value that we need to cherish and constantly be asking ourselves this question, how am I doing with my life? In the New Testament, there is a verse of Scripture which is a great promise from God, sort of as a commentary on Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. The verse is found in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8, written by Paul to the Corinthian church, and here are his words. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. That promise is wedged in between other verses that talk about giving to the Lord. And right in the middle of that is this incredible word from the Father about His determination to provide for us when we're involved with Him in giving. And I want to unpack that verse very quickly today and help us all to understand the power of it, and I hope we'll take it home as some new fuel for our fire as we walk with God. First of all, I want you to know the power of God's promise. Listen to what Paul writes in his first phrase. God is able. Say that with me. God is able. And uh, we read that in the text, not just here, but we read it often in the New Testament. God is able. If we didn't have anything else in the verse but that, we would have enough, wouldn't we? Our God is enough. Our God is able. The question that often comes to us when we're dealing with this subject and we're trying to get off the ground and start doing the right thing, it's like this. If I follow God's instructions and I begin to give a tithe to his work, can he take care of me and my family? And Paul says, he is able. He can do it. God is able. Generous giving can be frightening because we understand our own limits, our own boundaries. We also know that naturally speaking, when we give something away, we end up with less than what we had before. But Paul reminds us in this text that generosity doesn't originate with our ability. It originates with God's. We are not able, but God is able. We may not be able to figure this out, but God is able. We will only give without fear and with confidence when our hearts and minds are convinced that God is able to keep his promise to us and provide for us. And he is able to do that. Listen to the words of Job from the Old Testament. He wrote, I know that you can do everything, God, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. In other words, Lord God, I trust you. Matthew 19 says, with God, all things are possible. You say, Dr. Jeremiah, you don't know what our finances are like. They're impossible, but God can do anything. I want you to know that. Even as messed up as your finances might be, God is able to help you straighten it out when you put him first. Over and over in the New Testament, we read this little phrase, God is able. God is able to keep that which I've committed unto him. God is able to aid those who are tempted. God is able to save to the uttermost. God is able to keep you from stumbling. Over and over, we have a God of great ability. Amen? 
When we put our trust in him, there's nothing that we need that he does not have. And he doesn't just have a little of it, he has an abundance of it. So we begin our understanding of the Jehovah Jireh God that we serve with this truth. Our God is able. He is able. The power of God's promise. Notice secondly the potential of it. When we think about the ability of God, we might ask this question. With all the people that he has to care for, why would I think he would care for me or that he would have enough for me when he has all these other people to take care of? But please notice the next word. God is able to make all grace. God has all grace. He has everything. Grace is a word that comes from a term which means gift. It is the word charis. Charis is the Greek word for grace. In the time when the Bible was written, rich people in the ancient world would often give what they called charises or gifts to their community. They might give a statue to be in the center or a, or a fountain to be in the center of their village. Uh, that charis was a, was a testimony to the wealth and abundance of the donor. They would give the charis so that the whole community would know they had the wherewithal to provide such a wonderful gift to the community. How many of you know that our God has enough grace for all that we need? He's given us the greatest illustration of that in his own son. God makes it happen. God graces us with his presence and his provision. You say, Dr. Jeremiah, how do you know that? I know it because God has done it for me. I'm not talking here about just having started doing this a little while ago. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been doing this for 50 years. I know I don't look that old, but I have been doing this <laughs> for 50 years. You say, in 50 years, has God ever not cared for you? Not ever once. There have been times when I've wondered where he was, and if he was going to be on time. But I give you this testimony with absolute clarity in mind and heart that I have trusted God and God has never let me down. Now, I'm no special person with God. Why would he do that for me and not for any? Because God has all grace for all those who put their trust in him. He is able. He is able because he's the God of all grace. And he proved that to us so that we would never forget it when he sent Jesus Christ. Listen to these words from 2 Corinthians 8, 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. God has so much grace that he even allowed his own son to come here in our behalf. If you can trust him with your soul, the God of all grace who gave you Jesus, how would he ever withhold anything that you would need if he would already give you Jesus Christ, his own son? So the power of God's promise, God is able. And the potential of it, all grace. Now notice the proportion of it. God is able to give you all grace so that you can abound. Notice that little word, abound. This word appears twice in this verse that we have read. God is able to make all grace abound towards you so that you may have an abundance for every good work. I have studied 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 over the years many times, and I'm always amazed at how many times in those two chapters the word abound, abundance, abounding, and you can go home sometime and just underline it in your own Bible. It's quite amazing. We have a God who is the God of abundance. You know, sometimes we don't think that, and sometimes we don't think we should be allowed to believe that. You know, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus came into this world that we might have life and that we might have it how? More abundantly. God wants us to receive his abundance. Now, that doesn't mean he wants us all to be multimillionaires. What it means is God has enough and he wants us to live in the overflow abundance of his grace so that we're not paupers, we're not beggars, 
We're men and women who honor the Lord with our lives, and he continues to shower his abundance upon us. I don't know if you ever do this, but once in a while, you should just take a moment and have a moment of reality about your life. You have your health, and you have your kids, and you have your family, and you have your friends. You got a house to live in. You might not have a lot, but you are an abundant creature in God's hands. Let me just say that this is a good time for me to remind you that God is not opposed to abundance. There are two views of money that usually fall into the churches that you know about. Over here is one where somebody says, God wants you to be rich and have everything you want, Uh, the biggest yacht in the harbor, the biggest car in the lot. God, that's what God wants for you. If you trust God, that's what he wants to give you. That's not true. And there are others that say God wants you not to have anything. He wants you to be poor. He wants you to be a pauper. He wants you to take everything you have and and denounce it. Neither one of them are true. God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to have abundance. He's not opposed to you doing well. And he gifts some people, doesn't he, with the gift of giving. And he gives that gift to them because they've been able to earn a lot of resources. And there's a sense in which in our churches we almost make someone like that feel guilty and they should never be made to feel guilty. That's God's provision for them. That's God's abundance for them. God loves for his children to have an abundance. And God has enough for all of us if we put our trust in him. Someone has said that the grace of God is not something mere, M-E-R-E, It's something more, M-O-R-E. God is not interested in just you having merely enough. He wants you to have more than enough. He came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. That means a lot of other things except financial resources, but it means that too. The power of God's promises, he's able. And the potential of it is that he's got all grace. And the proportion of it is he wants you to abound. And the provision of it is that you always having all sufficiency in all things. Now stop for a moment and let me tell you what I've learned about this verse. This is the most positive statement in the entire New Testament. Here's the question. Will God give back to you when you trust him and give? The answer is five times yes. Notice. All grace Always, all sufficiency in all things to every good work. All, always, all, all, and every. God says, I want you to have everything you need. I want you to have all the grace that is necessary. Paul piles these superlatives one on top of another. This isn't fantastic. It's not foolish. It's factual. God wants to bless you. And it teaches us That the right attitude plus the right action equals the blessing of God. All grace, always, all sufficiency for all things so that you can do every good work. Now, whatever it is you think you don't have, if you know the Lord, it's found in that promise. In the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians, this same apostle is writing a letter to, I think, his favorite church. I've always thought Philippi was Paul's favorite church, especially because all of the words of endearment in the first chapter where he speaks about his love for them. But in the fourth chapter, in the latter part of the book, Paul is reminding the Philippians that he's so thankful for them because when nobody else was supporting him in his ministry, the Philippians stepped up and they took on some support so that Paul could continue to serve the Lord. And he pauses at the end of his letter to give them thanks. And he tells them how blessed he is because they have given to him and how blessed God is and how blessed the people are to whom he has ministered. And then he makes this promise to them. He wants them to know that the same God who has blessed him through their gifts is the God who wants to bless them themselves. And he gives them this promise. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Notice, he did not say, God will supply all your greed. He said he'll supply all your need. He isn't going to promise to give you all your wants. God will give you what you need. 
And I'm so grateful for these promises because they remind us that when we go out on faith and put our trust in God, we're not out there by ourselves. The resources that stand behind the promise of God is the abundant grace of God himself. The power of God's promise is that he is able. The potential of it is to give you all grace. The proportion of it is that he will abound your grace. And the provision of it is that you always having all sufficiency in all things. And now here maybe is the most important thing for us because we're all sort of somewhat taught about this. And this is not one of the more taught principles of stewardship. But listen up. The purpose of God's promise is, watch this. Here's the purpose. This is why God blesses us. Watch. So that we may have an abundance for every good work. God doesn't give us an abundance so that we can put it in the bank and notice how much we have. We need to put some of it in the bank and provide for the future and inheritance for our children and all of that. But God wants to give us an abundance so that we will be able to have enough for every good work that he puts in front of us. He wants us to have an abundance so that we can take what he gives to us and channel it into the kingdom for every good work. Here we are reminded of God's purpose to bless you. God doesn't bless you for yourself. He doesn't bless you so you become a hoarder. He blesses you so that you can be a part of every good work, so that you can be a channel and God can use you as a channel. He blesses us all in the same measure so that we can take what he gives to us and make it available for the good work of God. And when we do that and we're faithful in doing it, guess what? He keeps giving us more. He keeps blessing us. When he sees that we understand the purpose of it, he continues to supply the essence of it. Someone put it this way. If you lend your boat for a whole afternoon to Jesus Christ... It'll end up being his pulpit, and he'll send it back to you at the end of the day full of fish. You can count on it. If you place your upper room at his disposal for a single night, he'll fill it up with the Holy Spirit of Pentecost. If you place in his hands your barley loaves and fish, he will not only satisfy your hunger, but he will add 12 baskets full of fragments so you can have them to take home with you at night. Here's God's promise that he wants you to be involved with him in his work. To me, that's the most exciting thing about stewardship. I get to partner with God and see what God and his people together can do to put a dent in the darkness of the devil's world. God is enabling us to have an abundance for every good work. I praise his name for that. I give him glory. Give him a hand clap today, would you please? And in the process of being used by God, we are changed. In his book, Experiencing God as Your Provider, Brian Cluth writes these words. Listen carefully. He said, when you learn to trust God as your provider and then generously and faithfully share whatever he entrusts to you, Everything changes. Your life changes. Your future changes. Your attitude changes. Your buying changes. Your giving changes. Instead of being gripped by fear, your hearts are filled with faith in the God who has promised to provide. You will no longer fear what you used to fear or crave what the world craves. You will stop grasping for things that don't last and open your hands so that God can take what you have when he needs it. Awaiting your treasure in heaven, you will enjoy God's provisions now. You will have the best of both worlds, God now and God forever. <laughs> That's what happens when you trust him with your provision. I look back over my shoulder over these five decades of doing this. I have my own stories, but I won't bore you with them. You have yours. In ways I can't explain, at times I never could comprehend, God has intervened and stepped forward and done things that are just amazing to me. 
And he will do that for any. That's his purpose. He is our provider. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great British preacher, was traveling back to London after having held some meetings out in the country. And he was coming back home by train. When he got on the train, he ended up in a compartment with just one other person. And as he boarded the train, he realized that he did not have his ticket. So as he got on the train, he began to fumble with his pocket seat and had turned him inside out trying to see if he could find his ticket. And his compartment companion said to him, have you lost something? And he said, oh yeah, yeah, I don't have my ticket. And he said, truth be told, I don't know where my watch is and I don't have one dollar, one cent, one pound on me. I don't have any money. But he said, I need you to know something. It's not the first time I've been in a situation like this. I've been on my Lord's business for many years and he's intervened so many times to overcome my difficulties. So I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to enjoy the journey. And he sat down in the car. Short while later, the conductor came through collecting the tickets. He touched his hat to Mr. Spurgeon's companion. They had a few words together, and the conductor passed right on through. Well, that's strange, said Spurgeon. He didn't even ask for my ticket. And his companion said, well, that's just another illustration of what you told me earlier about God's provision and his watching over you. You see... I'm the general manager of this entire railway company. <laughs> and no doubt God had you in my compartment for just as moment as this, just when I could be of service to you. And here's what I want to tell you guys. Listen up. Almighty God is our general manager. And we're in relationship with him. And when we have a need, and we don't know where it's going to come from, in our compartment, is the one person in the universe, the God-man, the God himself, who can provide. When we give to him, what we're saying in the most powerful way is this, Lord God, I am trusting you to be my provider. Don't try to think about how you're going to do this yourself, because you will be discouraged. Many will tell you that you cannot do it yourself, but in God, you have your provision. He's your general manager. He's in your car. You're going to be just fine. Whatever you need, God never fails to meet every need of his trusting child. He is, say it with me, Jehovah Jireh. One more time, Jehovah Jireh. Amen. After the death of former President George H.W. Bush at the age of 94, the media began discovering a lot of activities that he had secretly pursued during his life. And in some cases, it came as a surprise to those who knew him. Unfortunately, usually when we hear secrets that come out after somebody dies, we cringe. But in the case of H.W., we smile. The news wasn't about scandal or shame, but about compassion and care. Turns out, he had been quietly helping many people using the name G. Walker so that they wouldn't know he was the president. For example, for years, Bush sponsored a Filipino boy named Timothy through the nonprofit organization Compassion International. He made contributions toward Timothy's support and regularly wrote him letters. The two started corresponding when Timothy was seven, and in his first letter, Bush wrote, I want to be your new pen pal. I'm an old man, 77 years old. I don't like that part of the story, but I love kids. <laughs> uh, but I love kids, and though we have not met, I love you already. I live in Texas. I will write to you from time to time. Good luck, G. Walker. Well, occasionally, Bush would drop hints about his real identity. In one letter, he sent a picture of his dog saying, This is Millie. She's met lots of famous people. Another time he wrote, we're going to have Christmas this year with my son at his house. And oh, he lives in a big white house. <laughs> but Timothy never caught on. He would write Mr. G. Walker, and Mr. G. Walker would read the letters and reply, offering encouragement. After Timothy graduated from the program at the age of 17, a Compassion International worker flew to the Philippines 
to tell Timothy the true identity of the man who had been such a blessing to him. Timothy was dumbfounded. I knew he was a kind and encouraging and wonderful man, but I had no idea he was the president. It was hard for him to grasp that the president of the United States would know his name and care so much about him. Like Timothy, we find it difficult to believe such a great man would care about his life. We too can find it difficult to believe that Jesus cares for us. Sometimes we know he's there, but we don't know that he cares. We don't know for sure that he cares. People sometimes tell us that he does, but it's hard for us to believe that he could really, I mean, there's so many of us. How could he care for us? Yet when you survey the life of Jesus, you find a man who cared for the people around him in surprising ways. He touched lepers, he cured the sick, he befriended social pariahs, he cherished children. His last acts were to pray for the forgiveness of his murderers and then to look beside him and feel compassion for a dying thief whom he encouraged and assured of salvation. The more difficult Jesus' life became, the more people crowded around him with demands, and the closer he moved to a torturous death, the more loving and caring and forgiving he became. When Jesus saw broken humanity, he reached out to care for them. And I don't know about you, but one of the first verses I learned as a little child was 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Although Jesus is no longer walking beside us in the physical realm, his concern for us is no less real. And the Bible tells us that one of the ways he chooses to care for us is through prayer. I mentioned this to you earlier in this series that Jesus is praying for us, but I wanna unpack and explore that a little bit further today. After Jesus accomplished all that was necessary for our redemption and salvation at the cross, he took his place at the right hand of the Father. And from there, for the last 2,000 plus years, he has continued his ministry to us through prayer. We all know that we pray to Jesus, but we may not know that Jesus prays for us. The Bible speaks about this in several places in generality. For instance, Romans 8 says it this way, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. He's interceding for us, said Paul to the Romans. And the writer of Hebrews echoes these words. Because he continues forever, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always makes intercession for them. Mark it down in your notes that Jesus is praying for us. Have you ever had the experience of knowing that someone was praying for you? I mean, that there's not anything like that in the world to know that people are praying for you. So many times you guys send me notes or personally tell me, Pastor, we pray for you every day. And you have no idea what that means to me, to know that you pray for me and that I pray for you. I remember reading about John Patton of Scotland who grew up in a small Scottish cottage where he could hear his father praying for him in the next room. And the sound of his father's voice in prayer followed him through all of his life. Even after his father's death, he said he could still hear his father praying for him as he would think about him. Ann Worthington is a lifelong Christian worker who now has retired in North Carolina. She recalls her parents rising every morning for devotion. She said, when my father was working, he would get up at 4.30 and study and pray. And as long as I live, I will remember hearing him in the bathroom praying out loud over his prayer list. I remember hearing my mother pray for me. I would come home from a game or from some outing and oftentimes I would walk in and I would hear my mother praying for me out loud. Perhaps you're thinking as you listen today, you know what, Dr. Jeremiah, I don't think anybody's ever told me that they're praying for me. I'm sure there's somebody here like that. 
Well, you can have that joy right now because on the final night of his normal earthly life, Jesus gives us a glimpse of his prayer life, how he prays for us. It's recorded for us in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. This passage is normally referred to as Christ's high priestly prayer. It's the longest section of the words of Jesus in the Bible. And some of the great past teachers of the Bible have said this is such a special passage that they don't dare preach on it. So when they're preaching through the book of John, they preach through the 16th chapter, and then they preach from 18 on, and they just read John 17. Some people say John 17 is holy ground. Take your shoes off when you come to John 17. This is Jesus praying, and we have the words of his prayer. Now the chapter is organized so that the first five verses record Jesus' prayer for himself. And verses 6 through 26 record him praying for his disciples. And in that section where he prays for his disciples, he's praying for us. And there we can learn several things about what Jesus prays when he prays for you and me. Very interesting that his prayers are quite different than ours, although in some ways they're the same. What's the one thing we pray about most often when we pray for our children, especially if they're not around us? We pray for their protection and their safety. And I want you to know, first of all today, that Jesus cares about your security. Read with me John 17, verses 11 and 15. We'll put them up on the screen. This is what it says. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. In these verses, Jesus is praying that the Father would keep us secure in the world. Has there ever been a time in your history or mine when we've needed that more? To know that the Father is hearing prayers from the Son for our protection. We are living in a dangerous world and a frightening world in many respects. But Jesus is praying for us. He's asking the Father to keep us safe as he himself had kept his disciples safe while he was on this earth. The word keep is a wonderful word. It means to guard or watch over I think of Jesus on one occasion, the disciples are out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee in the boat and they're in deep trouble. There's a big storm. While they're out in the boat, Jesus is up in the mountain. The Bible tells us he went up to the mountains to pray. And when they got to the moment of their greatest trial, Jesus comes to them in the midst of the storm because he'd been watching over them from the mountains. And when he wasn't in the boat with them, he was watching over them in prayer. And that's what he prays for us. Father, in the midst of their storm, in the midst of their difficulty, in this world, watch over them, protect them, and keep them. He's praying for your security, for your safety, and for mine. There's a story from World War II about the town of Dover, which ended up on the front line of battle. Not because they wanted to be there, but because of the way the battle was going. They were on the French coast of England, and they found themselves right at the front line. They were being bombarded by long-range guns located on the occupied French coast and in imminent danger every day of being invaded by the Germans who were at the other end of their little village. And looking at their situation, you would have thought there was no way they would have lasted till the end of the war. But when World War II ended, there was Dover. They survived and were there to encourage others with the joy of victory. Basically, military experts tell us they survived for three reasons. Number one, there was an internal garrison of artillery within the city. And that artillery was able to offset the other shots that were coming in, the guns that were were pointed toward them. Number two, the ships of the Royal Navy that patrolled the English Channel kept at bay the invading forces of the French. And thirdly, fighter planes of the Royal Air Force flew overhead and provided a protective umbrella for them. So in spite of the mortal danger and the fact that nobody thought they would survive, Dover survived the war and shared in the total victory. Just like Dover, you and I are protected. We have a threefold protection just as they did. The indwelling spirit in our hearts is the garrison against the attack of the enemy. 
The word of God in our hands is the guard with which we must do combat. And up in heaven, overhead, just like the Royal Air Force, is Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, praying for us that we might be protected. I look back over my life, and I'm sure you could do this as well, and I realized that there were many times when I was at a crossroads where I had a decision to make and I didn't know what to do. And if I had made the wrong decision, it would have changed everything about my life. I surely wouldn't be here today. I could have gone the wrong way. It was the indwelling Holy Spirit that brought conviction to my heart, kept me from doing the wrong thing. And oftentimes when I was at a point of decision, I would be reading the Word of God and a portion of God's Word would jump off the page into my heart and it was like God was speaking out loud and I would know, this is the way, walk in this way. And I would do the right thing. Where if I had been left to myself, I would have probably done the other thing. How many of you know as you look back over your life, you did a lot of things you didn't want to do, but they turned out to be the right things. <laughs> but the one thing I'll never understand till I get to heaven is this. When the Holy Spirit has done all he can do to keep me out of trouble, and the Word of God has done all it can do to keep me out of trouble, there's still more. For up in heaven, next to the Father, is my Savior, and he's praying for me. He's praying, take care of Jeremiah down there in El Cajon. Don't let him do something foolish. Keep him from the evil one. Don't let him get caught up in something that could ruin his life. The Word of God and the Spirit of God and the prayer of the Lord at the right hand of the Father. I found these words again from the Old Testament Psalms. They fit right here. Let me read them to you. Psalm 121, verses 3 through 8. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth even forevermore. The Lord is our keeper and he is praying for us at the right hand of the Father. Then in the next verse, Jesus asks his Father, to protect us from the evil one. How many of you know that Satan is our accuser? He's called the accuser of the brethren. The Bible says he goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. What is he trying to devour? He's trying to devour our influence. He's trying to devour our testimony for Jesus. He can't devour our salvation because he has no right to take that from us but he can destroy our reputation and destroy our influence for God. He's always about that, testing us and trying to get us to make the wrong decision. But did you know that the Lord Jesus is praying for us that we will not be overcome by Satan? The best illustration of that is in a verse of scripture concerning Peter. Luke chapter 22 verse 31 Jesus is talking to Peter, and this is what he says, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. When Satan singled out Peter, Jesus assured Peter that he would not face the evil one alone. He told Peter that he was praying for his faith not to fail. Now we know hours later, it appeared as if Peter did fail. He denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times. But how many of you know that wasn't the end of the story? You have to read all the way through the book of John to the 21st chapter. And after Jesus' resurrection, Peter returns to Jesus and Jesus gives him the assignment to strengthen the brothers. In other words, in response to Jesus' prayer, God allowed Satan to sift Peter, but he did not allow Peter to fall through the sieve. And although Peter fell, his faith did not fail. What a reminder to us men and women that Jesus cares enough to pray us through our failures. All of us are, are men and women who have failed. We're not failures, 
because we fail, but we have all failed in some way. And when we fail, the Bible gives us this encouragement that as Jesus prayed for Peter during his three-point denial of Jesus, Jesus prays for us. Even, you know, we think, well, when we succeed, it's Jesus praying for us. No, when we're failing, Jesus is praying for us. And he prays us through our failures so that we get back to the place of fellowship with him. We don't fully understand the spiritual warfare that we face every day. We do not know all the ways in which the devil accuses us before God, but we have the blood of Jesus Christ pleading for us, and we have the one whose blood is pleading for us. Jesus protects us from the evil one. He shields us by his prayers and by the power of his blood. His prayers are a protective force around us. Jesus is praying for us. What is he praying? He's praying for our protection. He's praying for our security. Number two, Jesus cares about our sufficiency. Verse 13 of chapter 17 says, Now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. In verse 13, Jesus prayed that the joy he has might be fulfilled in us. He wasn't talking about just joy, but fulfilled joy, overrunning joy, abundant joy, sufficient joy. He was talking about Jesus' joy. Let me tell you, as you know, he's not talking about happiness. That depends on the happenings. He's talking about joy. That depends on Jesus. And Jesus' joy is so amazing. Jesus' joy is the answer to the Hebrew greeting, shalom. They tell us that the word shalom means more than peace. It means a sense of well-being within a person. The joy of Jesus is that sense you have that no matter what's going on around you, the most important thing is okay. And in your heart, there's this feeling, this sense of the sufficiency of the joy of Jesus. I've seen this illustrated in so many believers, and I've even experienced it sometimes in my own life that during very troubling times and times that would normally take a smile off of your face, the inward Jesus puts joy in your heart that's beyond anything you can explain. You know, Jesus was a joyous person. I've always been amazed that when Jesus came on the scene, his first miracle wasn't at a funeral, but at a feast. It was at the Feast of Cana of Galilee. It was a marriage. Everywhere you look, Jesus was involved in joy. Throughout the New Testament, he generously imparted his joy to other people. One day he healed a crippled woman. She stood right up and began praising God. The Samaritan leper healed by Jesus returned to Jesus and the scripture said, he was praising God in a loud voice. And when the lame man at the gate beautiful was healed, he got up and went into the temple. Listen to this. He was walking and leaping and praising God. Now there's a man who's happy. Describing these moments in the life of Jesus, Paul put it this way. He said, the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul said, our lives ought to be characterized by righteousness and peace and joy. We ought to be the most joyous people in the world. We can't help it. We rejoice. We sing upbeat music. We sing happy music. We sing joyous music. I know some people think you worship with a dirge, but I can't put that together in the New Testament scripture. We are to be people of joy. We should never apologize for being joyous. One of the great lessons I learned when I studied the book of Ecclesiastes, which is a rather dark book because it records the, uh, the writings of Solomon when he was away from God and he's trying to reason life out as if there were no God. But even in the midst of all of that, eight times in Ecclesiastes, we are told to rejoice in the life that God has given us. Men and women, we should not go around all sober and look like, like life is over. Even in the most difficult things we have on earth, we have so much to be joyous about. Lewis Smedes was one of my favorite writers. He's in heaven now, but his books remain. Here's what he said. You and I were created for joy, and if we miss it, we miss the reason for our existence. 
Jesus experienced joy in his life, and now he's praying that we do the same. When I wake up in the morning, I often say this, as tired as I might be and as much as I don't want to get up, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, if you've ever been through a serious illness, maybe one where you weren't sure if you're going to make it or not, every day is a gift from God, isn't it? And every day is a day to rejoice, and every day is a day to say, today is God's a gift to me, and I'm going to rejoice in this day. I may not know the answers to all my problems, but I will not be defined by the difficulties of my life. I will be defined by the joy of Jesus in my heart. Jesus gives us that opportunity. Now, listen to all that, and then just let me remind you again, this is what Jesus is praying for us. He's not only praying for our security, he's praying for our sufficiency. He wants us to have joy, Jesus' joy, fulfilled joy, shalom in our hearts. Here's the third one. Jesus cares about your maturity. This is found in John 17. Jesus is praying, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. When I was a child growing up in my father's church, we used to have Wednesday night prayer meetings, and Sunday night church services. And quite often, both on Wednesday night and Sunday night, they would take time out of the early part of the service for what they called a testimony meeting. We would have open testimonies. We do that now at funerals. We used to do it in church. Open testimony, open mic. It was always interesting. But what I noticed was there was always about three people that every week they would be the first ones up. And I hate to say this, but it was three ladies. And they always said the same thing. They would get up and say, I'm just so thankful that I'm saved and sanctified. And then they go sit down. I knew what saved was, but I wasn't sure what sanctified was. And I was pretty sure I didn't want it because I didn't want to turn out like them. <laughs> I didn't know what sanctified was until many years later. And I found out it's not a bad word. It's a good word. Sanctified means to be made holy. Up in heaven, Jesus is praying that you and I will be good people, holy people. He's praying for our sanctification. The Bible is God's chief means of bringing that about, and so we aren't surprised to read that his prayer goes like this. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. What he's praying is that when we open this book, we don't just learn more of the Bible, but the Bible gets into our lives and changes who we are. He, he says, sanctify them, make them holy by your truth. Your word is truth. He's praying for us right now as we meet in this room that the word of God that we're studying from John 17 will not just pass through our minds and out the other side, but they will find a place of residence in our hearts, and we will listen to the words, and those words will change us from the inside out. That's what Jesus is praying. He is praying for our sanctification. He is praying for our maturity. Here's the fourth one. He's praying about our ministry. In John 17, 18, he says this, As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Now let me just break that down for you. Jesus was the first missionary to the world in which you and I live. One day in heaven, God called his son to the throne and said, I need you to go to the earth where the people are struggling and don't know what to do and they're in sin. I want you to go there and seek and to save that which is lost, pay the penalty for their sin on the cross. Now Jesus is saying to his father, just as one day you sent me into the world, I am sending all of your disciples, including us, into the world with the same message to seek and save the lost. Whenever we go out to do the ministry God has given us, we can be assured that up in heaven, Jesus is praying for us. He's praying for me when I preach, as all of you do. Some of you pray that I won't preach so long. I understand that. <laughs> But I don't think Jesus is praying that. I think you all are praying it, but I don't think Jesus is praying that. He's praying for you when you usher. He's praying for you when you teach children. He's praying for you when you work in the parking lot. He's praying for you when you drive the shuttle. He's praying for you when you serve on the board. If you're in the ministry of Jesus, you can count on it. You are on his prayer list. And he's praying for you that you will carry out the ministry in a way that brings fruit to the kingdom. He's praying for your ministry. Here's number five. He's praying for your unity. 
John 17, 20 and 21 says this, I pray, Jesus is praying now, I pray, Father, that they all may be one as you are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. In other words, Jesus is praying for our unity. He's praying that we have unity in our church. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because a lot of you would. Many of you have come out of situations where you've been in a church where unity wasn't anywhere to be seen. I remember reading about Ray Stedman. He said that Christians can be like a group of porcupines on a cold winter's night. They need to be close to another so they can reflect the heat from their bodies. But as soon as they get close enough to get heat, they prick each other with their quills, and then they spread apart again. I'm glad we don't have a porcupine church. I've been reminded recently of early days in my ministry when I first got to Fort Wayne. I used to go to the YMCA every day for lunch and play basketball for an hour. And there was a whole group of us that played. Some of those guys still write me, remind me how rough I was when I played. But anyway... You would go to the YMCA, and over the arch of the YMCA when you walked in it were these words from John 17, that they may be one. We'd walk through the arch and go down in the pit and kill each other for an hour. (laughs) But over the arch was that they may be one. (laughs) Kind of like many churches, you know, we speak it, but we don't live it. Thank God that at Shadow Mountain, we have this wonderful unity that God has given us. Don't take it for granted. And right now, up in heaven, Jesus is praying for our unity. He's praying for our oneness, that we would reflect according to the Bible the same spirit that he has with the Father. He wants us to be one in our unity. And then finally, Jesus is praying for our destiny. Listen to this. Verse 24 of chapter 17, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Now folks, here's another one of those little kind of upside down truths. We all know that we want to be with Jesus. I mean, all of us, we talk about that. As we get older, we have so many people that we've invested in heaven already. We look forward to the day when we're with Jesus and we're reunited with the people that we love. But here's what we may not know about Jesus. Listen to this. Jesus wants to be with us. It's not just that we want to be with Jesus. Listen to this. It says that they may be with me where I am. Jesus wants us to be with him. Over in John chapter 14, he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Now listen to this that where I am, you may be also. Jesus wants us to be with him. We want to be with him. We know that, but did you know that Jesus wants you to be with him way more than you want to be with him? It's his desire for you to someday be with him. If you put your trust in Jesus Christ, there isn't any doubt about the fact that that will happen. The Bible says when you're a Christian, if you trust the Lord, absent from the body is present with the Lord. As soon as you take your last breath down here, you take your first one up there. And you're absent from your body, but you're present with the Lord. And the Lord Jesus is so looking forward to that, that he prays about it in his prayers. It's on his prayer list. That one day, we will be with him. Listen, friends, Jesus is praying for us. He's praying for you. You've probably noticed that Chicago is being mentioned a lot. A lot of bad things happening in Chicago. Many people being murdered there every year. Every year it's either one or two in the number of murders. Gang warfare. Chicago's a rough place. It's always been known for its mobs, but right now it seems like we've gone back to the 20s. In mob, gang warfare, it's just awful. Right in the middle of Chicago is a place called the Pacific Garden Mission. When I was a student in college, I worked at a Christian radio station, and one of my tasks was to put the programs on the air that we aired on that station. One of them was called Unshackled. And Unshackled was a program about all the miracles that happened out of the Pacific Garden Mission. People that would come there, uh, it was, it's right down in the heart of, of the roughest part of Chicago. And people would come there with no options left 
Pacific Garden Mission was the place where you went if you didn't have anything. If you couldn't eat, they would give you food. They'd give you a bed to sleep in. And part of the deal was you had to go to chapel. And they had preachers in there all the time preaching the gospel. Hundreds of thousands of people got saved at the Pacific Garden Mission and went out to tell their story. Thus, you had the program unshackled. And it was kind of like the last resort. If you went there, you would just be overwhelmed at the condition of the people who filed in the door. They knew they could get something to eat. They knew there would be a place to sleep. Over the door of that mission were these words, words that make you almost cry when you hear them. Here's what's over the door of that mission. Your mother's prayers have followed you. That's what it, when you walk in the mission, that's what it says. Your mother's prayers have followed you. A subtle reminder to many of them that they had mothers who prayed for them. And those prayers followed them all the way to the mission in Chicago until finally they were arrested by the Spirit of God and brought to a place of redemption. I've discovered in my own life as a parent that there are certain things that we can do to influence our children. When they're small, we can guide them. We can make sure they go on the right path. We put them in Christian schools and we build some barriers around the edges of their life. But as they get older, there comes a time in our life when we have to turn them over to the Heavenly Father to pray that He would care for them, to pray that He would keep them, to pray that He would watch over them. I've gone through that with all of my children and some of my grandchildren. Lord, Nothing more I can do, but I pray that you will guide them. Prayer is an amazing thing, and the Father in heaven is hearing the prayers of his Son Jesus for you right now. When he prays for us, we draw near to him, he draws near to us, and he's praying for you right now. If you don't know him as your personal Savior, his prayer is that you might come to him and open your heart and receive him. And if you're a Christian, I don't know what you're going through this week, but let me tell you something. Jesus is praying for you. You pray to Jesus, but Jesus is praying for you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what your need is.